don't block the, the path of inquiry. Don't lay down rules that make it impossible for people to ask important questions. Welcome to the Thought Stretchers podcast, where we hope to stretch your thinking about important issues in education through rich inquiry. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm your host for these conversations for complexity and nuance. Hello again, and thanks so much for tuning in. I do appreciate it. Just a reminder that our PBL Summer Conference, which is titled PBL Grow 24, is open for registration, and you can find that at wegrowteachers.com, and you'll see it along the top menu there. This is our fifth time offering this, and it'll be in our home base of Louisville, Kentucky in June, and we'd love to have you attend if you're interested in learning more about how to implement and design project-based learning. We also have a couple of online courses available now, one which is PBL On Demand and another called Creating a Culture of Inquiry. Those are on sale for a limited time only at a deeply discounted price, so please go to, again, wegrowteachers.com and you'll see online courses along the top menu and you can find them there. As always, all of our professional development offerings are at wegrowteachers.com, and I'd encourage you to visit that and check out all of our blog pieces that you can learn from and share if you are so inclined. In addition to our main website, we of course have our Thought Stretchers education community, which you can find at thoughtstretchers.org. This is meant to be a place where you can have conversations that are more intellectually nourishing and less toxic and polarized. We have lots of events that we are offering throughout the spring, and you can find those in the events tab. So please jump on over to thoughtstretchers.org and create an account and sign in if you are already a member and join us for those conversations. As always, you can reach out to me at drew at thoughtstretchers.org with any comments, questions, or concerns. In this episode, I spoke with Bill Copeland, who is a professor at Syracuse University and the author of a book called The Path to Equity, Inclusion in the Kingdom of Liberal Arts. Bill's thesis is essentially that education, and especially higher education, is too focused on generation of knowledge and research and academic pursuits than they should be, and they should be more focused on building pragmatic skills and things that will help people be successful outside of academia and what one might call the real world. We talked lots about knowledge and understanding and inquiry and experiential learning and some of the tensions and pitfalls and things that we often talk about on this podcast. Certainly an interesting perspective that he has and much of it resonant with the work that we do, but also some things that I would be concerned about and I voiced those and we talked about those as well. Here's my conversation with Bill. I am with Bill Copeland, who is going to tell us a bit more about who he is and what he does and any relevant details, but he's the author of a book called The Path to Equity, loaded word these days, Inclusion in the Kingdom of Liberal Arts, uh, a loaded subtitle, I suppose. But Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the book. Well, I mean, the main thing is I went to college thinking I was going to get a job because I came from a middle class family. And um, I was given a lecture on uh, Chaucer. And that was a shocker for me. What, what, is, what is this guy doing? What is this? And then I, it took me quite a while to realize that the purpose of most college faculty is to make scholars, other college faculty. And their theory is uh, by being a scholar and studying various things, you will acquire the capability to have a good life. Uh, which there, I don't see any empirical evidence for that. Um, and so that set me off on a long-term journey since 1955, 56, um, to change that. Because I think the purpose of an educational institution is to help people get what they need and to certainly not um, lie to them and have a business model where they say, come here and you'll get this. And then when you get here, they give you something else. Hmm. So that's been driving me off and on. And then I went to, I was at Washington College, which was a small college on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And then I transferred to Hopkins. I didn't really know. I transferred to Hopkins so I could live at home because I didn't like the noise in the dorm. So uh, 
I didn't know Hopkins was a big deal university. I just thought, well, there's another college I'll go to. And I went there and went through that thing. Uh, and by the time I was a senior, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I accepted another big lie, which is you should um, work in something you're interested in. So I was interested in international relations, which then that leads, right, to go to the Foreign Service. Um, and uh, I, was, I thought international relations was interesting because it was so open-ended. Um, so I, I took the Foreign Service exam, passed the written, oral, they told me I was too young, come back in five years. But I'd also um, enrolled at, a, at um, American University for a master's. Um, and then when I got there for lots of different reasons, um, I started teaching right away, like second year. So I was teaching two, three courses a semester. I even taught for two years at, at uh, Howard University because I don't have to go into the detail there. And I love teaching, um, but I didn't really understand that college professors are supposed to publish first and teach second. Mm -hmm. I uh, totally over my head, didn't even realize it. I had trouble getting a job, got a job by a fluke, which I don't want to go into detail, it takes too long, but it was a fluke. And I ended up at Wayne State. And for some reason, I guess I was very gifted because I published a lot in journals and books. And they, um, I became their little star. Uh, and then I went to them and said, I want to teach the 2000 student freshman course, which is introduction to social sciences. And the dean said, well, you can't do that. And I said, why? He said, because you got to keep publishing. Um, and then I realized Wayne State wanted to be the Ann Arbor of Detroit, just like Ann Arbor <laughs> wants to be the, the um, Harvard of Ann Arbor. Of I Michigan. would say they want to be the East Lansing of, of Michigan, but that, uh, yeah, that's my well, bias. <laughs> you know, the East Lansing people would like to be the Harvard of Michigan, right? <laughs> yes. So then I um, went to Syracuse for lots of reasons. I got into a position where I had my own program and courses and no faculty. I, I had a colleague that worked with me, but I, I had no faculty. And I designed a curriculum called Policy Studies that got through, would never get through today, got through, and it became a major. And now it's uh, one of the biggest majors in arts and science, and it's hugely successful, measured by the number of alums, not who give money, but who keep coming back to school and writing stuff. And that... Um, convinced me that I had created an alternative to normal college because the, the, the theme of, of the policy studies major is skills through experience to do well and do good. That was my goal. Do well and do good. You're going to leave here and you'll be able to do well, whatever, however you define it, and also be a do-good or a good citizen. And that rang the bell of a lot of students. And I ran a course where they had to go find information. I didn't give them any information. I gave them concepts. So it was all about skills and how to think and not about what to think. Uh, and then because I, I, I know students have different backgrounds and different interests, you give them a reading, it's likely to be irrelevant to half of them. Um, let them go find what they want to read. So that philosophy led to... Um, very successful. And then I started working at the K through 12, mainly high school. My course was uh, offered at 50 high schools, 50 to 100 high schools around, around in New York State. About 120 high schools have had that course over the last 30 years. Um, and I trained the teachers to teach the way I taught. And a lot of, there was some resistance from them, but it was such a good deal. They did it anyway because they were getting the best students. And, um, so that, and so I have hundreds of faculty, high school faculty, that have taught my course. And what was the name of that course? Introduction to the Analysis of Public Policy. It's, it's PST 101. PST stands for Policy Studies. 
introduction to the analysis of public policy. It's about analysis. Uh, and I tell the students, you can only learn through experience. You can read all the stuff you want. You won't even know, you won't know anything. You have to actually do it. So they get involved in the school system or in uh, boys and girls clubs or various kinds of uh, nonprofits. And then the major itself has them actually do a study for a client in the community, like a survey, something like that. Uh, and then they have an internship. So all that's part of the, of the major. And those kids who uh, really want to do something, who are frustrated by all this scholarship, uh, it appeals to them. And it turns out, I'm always trying to hit the lower half of the students, which uh, is very difficult. Uh, it turns out the upper half really loved it. And one of the key changes that I made was I stopped using graduate assistants and used undergraduate teaching assistants. Um, they're now called course assistants because the graduate student didn't like them being called teaching assistants. So I have 20 teaching assistants I had in the course of 150 kids. So, um, my tw so each teaching assistant had six or seven kids to advise, coach, and run exercises. They also graded the papers. I went to... Uh, I, by the way, I feel like I just go on and on, so feel free to stop me, you know? <laughs> yeah, you are uh, meandering a bit here. Well, yeah, one, okay. So one question that I, I you were talking about top half and bottom half, are you talking about academics and grades and that kind of thing? Okay. So you're a professor now, right? Right. And explain for folks um, wh who that, like, what is that role? What are you teaching and, and what is your role there? Okay, so uh, I just... Um, I ran the policy studies major. I taught two or three courses a semester in the major, especially the introduction, up till two years ago, because I'm in my 80s now, and they're worried about me not showing up one day. Should be and a presidential candidate. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm better than those two. Anyway, uh, so we point another another teacher is teaching it, and he's pretty much sticking to the way I taught it because the 20 TAs really run the course. They do the grading. We, I mean, the structure I gave them, he now fixes the structure. Um, but there's all kinds of activities in the class. So the undergraduate TAs are an essential part. And when I look back over the whole thing, I think they're the most important reason for the success of the major. First of all, what happens is 150 kids take the class, 70 or 80 are going to get A's, 40 or 50 apply to be TAs. Those who become TAs then recruit other students into the course. They become a tribe of themselves, and they promote the major. And I've had um, – partners of big law firms and other people say to me when they were a freshman and they took 101 and you made me a TA I realized I really belonged in college because up to that point I didn't know what I was doing or what was going on so it's sort of a transformative for the kids to become TAs second semester of the freshman year mm -hmm. and uh, they then are on an elite path and their success has been phenomenal. There's at least 20 CEOs of corporations. There are probably clarify, many more. So, so can you clarify, because I'm sorry if I missed it. So the major and the courses or course that you're talking about, what, what are the titles there? The major is policy studies. Okay. The courses or introduction to the analysis of policy studies. There's one on research methods okay. where the kids actually do a project. They also take economics. They take a course that surveys issues. That's not taught by my department. It's taught by another department. Okay. Um, and then they take courses that they're interested in, and they take a course in policy implementation. Okay. So they get a degree in what, policy? B a BA in policy studies. Okay. 
Okay. And the book that you've written, um, like I said, interesting title because you've got some language in here, some words that are certainly in the, the zeitgeist of K-12 and, and beyond education, the culture wars, the path to equity, equity being a, a trigger word for some people. Um, I'm curious, and of course, inclusion, which is the I and DEI. So I'm curious what you mean by the those things and why you chose to title it such or maybe you didn't maybe it was your editor because sometimes that happens well my original title was commoners in the kingdom of liberal arts but when i would tell to people they wouldn't laugh so i figured well they didn't get it <laughs> so maybe i gotta change it then i talked to the editor and uh a student has helped me write the book we were talking and I said, what I really want to do, I, I believe in trying to teach all the students all the time. That's my goal, all the students all the time. Not the top students, mm -hmm. all the students. And I believe that college is set up to benefit the best students and really to punish what are perceived as not good students. And the criteria of best is scholarly capability. But to me, a, a scholar is a very um, narrow, parochial, defined role. It's being a monk for the subject matter. And you sit around and talk to other monks and you argue about things. I don't see how that prepares people for citizenship or careers or life. It does. I, that's my assumption. It doesn't, just like it didn't help me. Mm. Um, so that's why I put in equity. And I'm also, I mean, I, I think I'm not, I'm against the idea of um, you can promote DEI by talking about it, which is what they do. It's all about words. I think you can promote, you have to promote it by your actions. Hmm. And if, I, if you're a professor and you're not trying to help all the students, how, how are you promoting DEI? even though you're a big DEI advocate. So that's why I put it in there, because I don't, I think it's very elitist what goes on. Um, there's an, I can give you an example of elitism. The kids who come to college who take a lot of AP and, and, and college courses, well, they get here and they are not aggravated by the liberal arts core. The people who are aggravated are the weaker students who didn't take these things in college. They got to go through this whole 60 credit thing. Mm -hmm. So, so a top student is able to take junior and senior level courses in their freshman year, whereas the bottom students have to go through this drill of you know, four sciences and four humanities and four social sciences and then math and all the all the most of the content in those courses is about scholarship it's about studying the study of you don't study politics you study what writers say about politics so you write essays comparing hobbes to locke or whoever mm -hmm. um well what's that going to do about anything about being a politician not much i well i don't think much i don't think the intellectual discussions of these things prepares you for these roles um i think experience prepares you for the roles so that's how i came to the path to equity the the book editor said well let's throw equity right up front because it'll maybe we'll get more hits <laughs> but i think the title and the subtitle is confusing I think I outsmarted myself with that. It's like, <laughs> I mean, when you saw it, what, you thought, what, what, right? And uh, I don't think that's the way to sell. Anyway. So, so, well, the, we're, so we're if there. I'm understanding correctly, after looking at the book, the, the sort of thesis is that the, that the higher education experience 
is focused on sort of academics and and sort of esoteric abstractions and discussions and that kind of thing. And of course, K-12 is is mostly meant for knowledge building and, and helping students understand concepts and basics and things like that. And ostensibly then higher education is mostly, not all, but mostly about knowledge creation, right? That's the research, that's the generation of knowledge. And and, and so it's not necessarily and, and much less about the, the, the generation or the understanding and acquisition of knowledge, but supposed to be about that, uh, that generation of knowledge. And that's why we have professors who generally, and this is a, a problem that I don't know how many people understand, but most professors don't ha- ever take much training in how to be a teacher. And so right. they, they tend to be lecturers. They tend to have TAs and GAs and whatever you want to call them doing the grading. And it's it's a transmission of knowledge. There are certainly some classes that are, are, are more interactive and, and and not just that. But it's not it, it's it's not. Um, something most professors are not particularly good teachers because they are focused on publishing and they've never been trained to do so but i guess then the 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 other part of the thesis if i'm understanding correctly and correct me if i'm wrong is that you're advocating for something that is less about that and more i don't want to say closely related related to something vocational but something more pragmatic and practical right that it's not that it's not about that uh, that it's not about gen- generation of knowledge. So I guess several questions. Uh, one is, do you, how, how would you, if if you assume that to be, you know, the shift that we would make, how would we then generate that knowledge? And maybe that's not that important to you, but how do you, how do you see that happening in lieu of, uh, you know, our, our universities going to something that is more pragmatic? Well, okay. I, I, I think the heart, the heart of the problem is P, the PhD, which can take four to eight years, is a socialization process to make sure they want to be in the scholarly cult that their mentors are in. And then they want to succeed and achieve in that cult so they can get tenure and paid. That is so dysfunctional in preparing people to help students achieve the goals they have, which is the capability to have a good job and the capability to be a good citizen. Um, the, The connection is there is a very tenuous connection between what I call knowledge and know-how. So this is more about know-how. Now what's happening, I'm actually saying, I see right now a skills revolution going on K through 16, where skills are coming more and more into the curriculum. Internships are becoming absolutely essential in college. Faculty doesn't like internships because it takes a lot of individual work. If they figured out how to do it, it wouldn't, but that's them. Um, the, the internship is, is sort of a, the big thing, experiential education, which is in disrepute repute among most faculty. They see it as dumbing down and giving away credit. Mm-hmm. And but put it another way, they believe in the Trinity, which is, Lectures, readings, tests. It's a trinity. Hmm. The trinity is a way to um, get students to memorize stuff, which they call knowledge. What good is that? Is that teaching them how to think? Is that teaching them how to function? I don't think so. It's teaching them to um, basically play the role and it comes out of the middle ages you know there was a religion then we went to then the book books got published then books and, and professors became the source of knowledge it's it's the 21st century it doesn't work today and so it's already happening and and the reason is the skills revolution is happening is because people are upset that 
kids aren't prepared for either citizenship or the workforce when they graduate, and especially at a high school, and even so at a college. But what's happening is also, I don't know if I'm making sense here, what do kids spend their time on in high school? Well, my grandkid, one of my, was, was into the arts and drama and theater and put on a show and did the costumes and did this. Did the, what did that do? That gave him skills. What did he get up in the morning wanting to do? To go to the theater thing in the afternoon and just deal with this, this uh, information memorize it and get it out of the way, get their A. So I see the students, if you, it's very interesting. You sit and look at a class, they all look like the students in my cover of my book. You go in the library and they're doing a project on something and they're all excited and interested. And I used to, because I, I visited high schools a lot. So these extracurricular things are becoming more and more important to students. And that's a good thing because they're developing skills it just doesn't generate academic credit, which it should. If I, you following me? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so let me pull apart some things because, in some ways, you're spe- you're you're preaching to the choir. We do a lot of professional development. Everything we talk about is through the lens of inquiry. We do a lot of project-based learning, professional development, and on the podcast here, I have in a, and in other places, sort of an ongoing, you know, debate is hopefully not the say, the right word, but in some ways it is this this dichotomy that I think is a false dichotomy between knowledge building and you know, sort of you could say surface knowledge and direct instruction, explicit instruction, these kinds of things, which I think we should be careful not to straw man and say that when that is done well, that it is the same thing as sort of lecture, your trinity, right? Your your lecture test and uh, memorization, whatever those three were. But the, and so we advocate for a balance of thinking about how we structure and how we engage kids and talk about preparing them for the modern world, which in my estimation is in large part of how to think, which is in large part about inquiry, about thinking in questions and using your your inquiry skills to frame problems and to, uh, you know, maybe go down uh, rabbit holes that are not as productive and you come back out. And so that was an interesting thought experiment and so on and so forth. All of that said, I think there is certainly a role for knowledge and the you know the, the the pushback that we get in the sort of progressive constructivist inquiry world is that well students can't think deeply about things that they know and nothing about and I think in large part that's true uh, they, they it's harder to ask really good questions if you don't know much about it so we try to think like how do we balance that knowledge how do we make sure that we're delivering those pieces of knowledge and helping students then wrestle with it in ways that are meaningful and and all of that is very very difficult and uh you know it can be done really poorly and students come out on the other end with no knowledge or little knowledge and little skills and right uh, pragmatically they are worse off than they might have been had they just had the sort of knowledge building so how do you think about those tensions I think that's a very good way. There is a tension. Um, Let me give you a very explicit example. I'm in political science. They they try to teach students about federalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do they do? They make them learn the definition. Mm -hmm. And then they go through the three, you know, the the three, the the, the Congress, the president, and then Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And then they do all this. And then they give tests, and then they say, it's really hard to teach about federalism. And my argument is, if you try and teach federalism abstractly, forget it. So I make kids do something at the local level, like they want to fix the school system. They may maybe make the age... Uh, when you can leave school high or 18, it's right, 16 now or 17, 18. Mm -hmm. So they come up with that proposal. And then I say, "Uh, who's implementing this? And they'll say, uh, the school board. And I'll say, well, will the state let them do it? 
and of course they don't know. I said, fine, after the state will do it. Let them do it. And then, uh, well, what about the feds? Are they going to tell the states what to do? Or So I came with this very concrete example, and now they know what federalism is. They know that. And, but if you give them the definition and the abstraction, guarantee you they will not understand it until they actually take an example. Now, if you give a lecture and give the example, it's not as good as if you say, well, go develop a local policy and see if you can fix it. And then you, and then you say, well, we've got to say, you follow me? So I think I'm a big believer, always start with the concrete, never start with the abstract. And that, and that means experience. This business of, well, they need knowledge. That most faculty will say they need to know what federalism is. Mm-hmm. They call that knowledge. My answer is you can't transmit abstractly what federalism is until they actually deal with it. Um, so, and the other, the other thing is this, like in the social sciences, you, you, uh, it, it, the kids don't know anything. They can't possibly know anything. So if they read a study of this or that, food stamps or whatever, is all they know is what was in that study. If they went and met somebody on food stamps and saw what happened, then they would have a base to understand the abstraction. So my problem with this knowledge teaching is that too many abstractions, it loses them. Some of the kids aren't interested. You need concreteness first. Start always with the concrete. Start always with the student. And the faculty starts with it, what's in their head. I want them here. I'm going to get them here. And sometimes they won't even scaffold to get them here. Mm-hmm. They'll just go right to here. And what that means is giving them a definition that they have to memorize and repeat back, which doesn't mean they understand anything. It's only if they look at the concrete. So I don't know if that answers your Yeah, well, your it, it resonates, and it's very similar to an example that I use in this sort of dialogue and debate. I was a social studies teacher, a political science major, so... One of the things when I talk about surface knowledge and learning and then deep and transfer and getting into those abstractions, you say, well, it's important that students know, assuming that everybody agrees with this, and most I think would, that they know the three branches of government and the three levels and federalism, right? So we we can teach them what those are, like that they, you know, executive, legislative, judicial you know, factually under knowing that, not even understanding that, because understanding is a is a different application there. But you have to have the knowledge then to to apply it and understand it. So one could teach that, could use direct and explicit instruction to do that. You know, test it, memorize it, whatever you want to do, and how deep you want to go with that. But until you have that then it's going to be hard to do the deep and transfer pieces of saying, well, maybe asking a question, uh, you know, considering is, does the executive branch in the United States have too much power at this point in history, right? And so situating that question and that knowledge inside of that question to then consider it. But to your point, one of the things that I would advocate for is some version of contextualizing all of that as we before we get into any of that knowledge acquisition, because, you know, I, as you were talking, I'm remembering my my some of my classes at Michigan State University back in the day, and I remember reading Leviathan and thinking, what in the hell is going on here? It, it's so deep and, and abstract. I, I mean, I had, I, I remember going into my professor and, and I didn't even know what to ask because I was so confused by it. But had that been placed into a context, then now you've got some things perhaps to, to connect it to. So one of the things that I do think is important is to build the knowledge but place it in a context and i think that's kind of what you're talking about there but the pushback that people will say is that is terribly inefficient and when we're talking about equity we have students who are coming out of k-12 going into whatever they might be going into higher education or whatever and they are so lacking in in knowledge that they are at a great disadvantage so we should really focus on building their stores of knowledge if for no other reason that 
those cultural shared pieces of knowledge are important. And I think that's that resonates with me. But the inefficiency of doing it the way that you're talking about um, and, and that I'm talking about is a, is a big pushback. So I don't know if you've heard that before, but I'm curious to get your reaction to that. That's very interesting. I, I, I don't know if I've ever heard that before, but I, I, I keep thinking as you're talking, you're assuming the student, it's important that the students understand or think about the power of the presidency versus Congress. Mm-hmm. My position is, why is that important? Because that's what intellectuals do. That's what scholars do. That's what the media does. And it's those people who are interested in that will talk about that, and that's a great thing. But why do 100% of the students have to have achieved that goal? Because the goals being set, these knowledge goals, are very elite. And they're also, ignore the fact that the world is really complicated now, very, very complex, much more complicated than when it was a couple hundred years ago, when all the, this knowledge thing was. Well, I'm saying that, that there's so much knowledge. I actually don't like the word knowledge because I don't think there is a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of speculation, some of which has some empirical support but there's not a lot of agreement on knowledge and the the move the DEI movement um, said well why are we teaching about the founding fathers why don't we teach about what what happened in China when they had a democratic regime or something like that so now we got the whole world to worry about are we going to give them that too <laughs> i mean wh- what are we doing here um Somebody said our curriculum's uh, a mile wide and an inch inch deep, mm-hmm. and so checking off all this stuff doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense in the 21st century. I'm worried about people being able to actually use the computer, which if they can't use a computer, well, they're headed for poverty. Um, all the, you, you can't even, you can't even, I can't get into the carrier dome. It's not the carrier. I can't get into the stadium unless I got my cell phone because they won't even give me a ticket anymore. Right. So who learns that? Who gets that? Well, the people who have parents that are wealthy, educated, they, they learn this. What about the other half who don't have that kind of support? They don't learn it. I think they should learn how to use the computer, how to how to use a ticket. And now these are very mundane purpose things that are not considered an educated person. You're not edu you know, these aren't considered as as the essentials of education. Mm-hmm. I I I think the essentials of education is to help people function in today's world as a employee and a citizen. I think that's the overall goal. And I don't think the people driven by the knowledge thing see that as the overall goal. Well, let me let me push back on on something that feels like a tension, and I, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding. So, I I, I I it's very resonant to me the idea that you know that just having knowledge and this di direct instruction, explicit instruction, all these kinds of things like that's I I would I characterize it as sort of necessary but not sufficient. Uh, and then it's, I think in some ways you're not nece- you're not even saying it's necessary. Uh, there are certainly some things that we want people to know, but they may not be and probably aren't limited to or maybe even including all these academic things. So teaching them how to think is certainly something that that I value and, and we talk about you know in, in a number of different ways, but. One of the things that strikes me as maybe a tension here is the, that complexity that you're mentioning that I agree with and the, the ways in which that presents itself to us as challenges in the world beyond, you know, just getting into a stadium. But, you know, how do we figure out how to who to vote for, how to talk to each other, um, how to pick 
and, and think about investing or uh, not investing or buying a home or traveling, where to be, that kind of thing, how to talk to people. One of the things that that seems to me to be important in that is these discussions, these kinds of, of dialogues that are generally done in the context of academic kinds of content, if that makes sense, right? We're talking about big issues and, and hard questions and uh, you know those complexities and nuances and probably not having that about your smartphone and the ticketing system, right? And that kind of thing. So the value of being giving students K-12 and beyond that opportunity to do that and learn, and to me, learning how to develop those skills and, and, and hear different opinions and maybe take a different side, those kinds of things are really sort of preparation for the modern world kind of skills that I think maybe live, uh, thinking out loud a bit here, but live more comfortably or naturally in that sort of academic knowledge kind of context. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, But the majority of students aren't interested in that and don't want to be interested in that and don't find that interesting. Um, then you can say, well, that's too bad. They need to learn it. But I'm saying, well, I mean, I had a, a student, a, a person, my, my son was green, dating this student who was top student. I asked her when the Declaration of Independence was, and she didn't know. And she's a senior. She didn't know when the Declaration of Independence was. She couldn't say. Now, I could say, well, she's dumb. Well, she's not dumb. She's a top student. She's a musician. She's got, she's in that tribe and in that environment. Mm-hmm. And what are the functions people need to, to function? And knowing when the Declaration of Independence was is not really essential. Right. Now, then you have the problem of the Declaration of Independence itself, uh, being more aspirational than real, right? All men are created equal. You we know. Well, mm-hmm. well, what is that about? Well, to be able to think about, well, that was said. Um, it didn't really mean it, but it it is aspirational. We're hoping to get there. That's good. I guess that's good. Uh, do I want every person who graduates high school or college to be able to understand what I just said? Um, yeah, I would like it, but it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen because there's such variation in the experiences background uh, of the students that it, the, the knowledge, knowledge uniformity is not going to happen. The other thing is I've always thought that not what is called knowledge are really like cultural artifacts that exist and die, have a very sh- relatively short life lifespan. Um, and then the teachers, the error they came up in, they have certain cultural artifacts that they believe in, but they're already talking to future generations, which has different cultural artifacts, but we call it knowledge as if it's permanent and universal. And I think part of the problem is it's aping the physical sciences. The physical sciences, I do think, have a more coherent concept of knowledge than the social sciences and the humanities. I look at the social sciences and humanities as mainly what they're called what they call knowledge. I look at that as speculation, some of which is better supported than others, but it's fleeting, not permanent, not universal. We can't agree on what it is. There's all kinds of fights and arguments going on. We keep changing the curriculum. The standards, the New York State standards are absurd if you look at them. One, one, I don't. I, I am rambling here. One thing that really bugs me: the Global Social Studies Regents Exam, which is a test of knowledge of global social studies, Mesopotamia stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like, why do they have to know about Mesopotamia? Why? Why? The problem that is created by this commitment is the reg- You have to pass the Regents Global Social Studies. Half the kids fail it. So what did the regions do? They require two years of it now. So the kids stop failing it. But they're still failing it. And what is the the value of that? I think it's 
based on the old traditional view of there's this knowledge that everybody needs to know. And when you say the word everybody, um, is that really diversity? I mean, people have different cultural backgrounds. They have different experiences. Um, let's give them the tools to think and function and not worry about what they know. Um, well, so this, that, this gets, that's my position. So that gets to uh, you know one of the problems that I think is increasingly unique in – you know, again, this modern world that we're inhabiting now, this sort of epistemological crisis that we're in, right? That we have different versions of truth, which is not the same thing as knowledge, but in some ways it's very similar, right? I have my facts, you have your facts, and in many ways those are uh, those are come up we come up with that those truths and knowledge based on our tribe or our identity or our exposure to media and or whatever we're exposed to and that's a problem in my estimation and and so when we talk about it, one of the things in your book title that grabbed my attention was you know the, the term liberal arts which is not the same thing as liberalism enlightenment liberalism and that process of how do we determine what's knowledge um that process that we that we go through as a collective almost social network as, a, as humanity to determine what is true, what is knowledge. And there are certainly, like, the, the earth is round, and almost everybody believes that. Not everybody, but most everybody, and we've come to that consensus, and that's an example of, of the sort of liberalism that I think we're in danger of getting away from increasingly. And I see education, K-12 education and beyond, b being... A culprit in that process and am advocating for and and working with schools trying to, to advocate for more and more how do we make sure that that process and that there's an understanding of those enlightenment principles uh, which are how we determine what is true what is what is actual knowledge which is different from perspectives and viewpoints um, and opinions but there's sometimes some overlap there. So to me, the one of the concerns that I have is that we're not doing that. And 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 I, I'm not even sure if there's a question for you there. It's just do can we engage how do we better engage students in that process and uh, and, and help us? Because I think that's part of our polarization and, and somewhat a downward spiral. I think first, first of all, I want to say that I agree with your view. I think we're very close on the importance of project-based learning and mm -hmm. engagement and that. So I think we're, but I think you're, you're not as extreme as I am. <laughs> I got this thing about this. Um, I, th I just think it's, it, it, I think the more active learning there is, the more project-based learning there is, the more kids do, the more, there is engagement by the student. That's a huge criteria because I, I'm sure you've read that the amount of hours college students spend on studying is like almost well, very little. Mm -hmm. You know, the norm is two hours of study outside of class for every hour in class. Well, that's nine hours a week. Well, that's uh, nine, you know, it's 140 hours a semester on one course. Oh, well, nobody does that. Right. Um, and so how, many, how much time are they spending? Well, they're spending enough to get an A, the good students. They're spending enough time to get an A. But they've figured out how to do it. As, as I always say, they're trying to minimize work and maximize grades. That's their, that's their, operational, hmm. that's their operational thing. And the, and the weak kids uh, don't know how to do that. The, the strong kids do, and then they're, and then they, that group of kids then have all these advantages. Mm -hmm. um, so I think engagement is the most important thing. When I run a course that requires kids to go in the community or go to school, go visit schools like 20 hours a week, most of the kids are not going to take that course. They don't want their 20 hours right. <laughs> stop by running, getting on a bus and going. So they, what they want to do is minimize the amount of work. So I think engagement is the most important thing, which is why I like these student activities. 
Um, here, here's an example. Model UNs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, many, many kids will say the most important thing they did in high school were model UNs. And was it because they really are interested in international relations? No. It was because they actually did something. Mm -hmm. They actually had to prepare a little talk. They had to meet. They had a, and, it, and, it would, and it was expanding their mind. So I think model UNs are great. I mean, the only I, I don't like it because it makes too many international relations majors who find out <laughs> there's no jobs. But and so it takes them three years to get out of that influence. But that's my example. And a lot of that stuff is going on. Now you have Odyssey and you have various mm -hmm. things going on that, that do what you want to do and what we want to do. Mm -hmm. The only problem is only the best students do that. What about the rest of the students? Well, what they don't. The so, so one distinction that I'm curious to get your your feedback on, because I, I again, I think we're very similar in how we think here and what we're advocating for. But I also see a real danger, and we see teachers doing sort of project based learning, these kinds of things, experiential things, and they tend to, or or too often, I'll put it that way, they too often, in my opinion, go f for and 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 are behaviorally engaging students but not cognitively engaging them and that to me is a missed opportunity because there's certainly we want behavioral engagement that's great the kids are enjoying it having fun and there's some at least uh, tacit skills being built and that kind of thing but what a missed opportunity for really not engaging them with good scaffolding and and building in some of those knowledge pieces and and, and really doing that work so that they are actually actively cognitively engaged and i think you know model un or things like that can run that risk too it's like we're just doing some social events and there's some fun and it's different and i get to work with my friends and i'm not sitting and listening and that kind of thing so curious about that and your thoughts i think that's a very good point um, and that gets to my basic position, which is most students don't love learning everything. They love learning certain things. And those who love these abstractions and these conversations and, and the, play the role of the intelligentsia, mm -hmm. okay, um, that benefits them, but that's a small percent. I mean, not not only well, it's a small percent. Like I have a lot of honor students. Um, they have high grades. I'm not impressed with their ability to think and use these terms. Mm -hmm. They're okay. Mm -hmm. um, they're not, you know, they're okay. And those who don't get to that level of discussion, I would like them to be more abstract, think more generally. I think it's only going to happen over time um, and, and not in college. Hmm. And the other thing is they get, they're interested in certain like auto mechanic or fixing their car or whatever they do, dance, dance works or whatever. Mm -hmm. These experiences do a lot of cognitive activities of problem solving that, but they don't do a lot of the studying the, cultural base the intellectual exchanges the the um they like to think and not do mm -hmm. and um i'd rather they do and then think um and i think that's a big problem and our school system rewards the thinkers yeah. and not the doers well again again i think that uh, it, it resonates strongly with me and and we want students to be to think and we and in my my estimation we want them to come away with you know significant knowledge what that knowledge is 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 always up for debate the it is interesting to me the 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 folks who advocate for knowledge and direct instruction that kind of thing everything is about measurable and quantifiable and my argument back is that that's important, but that there are other important outcomes as well. And some of those are much harder to quantify and measure. And sometimes those things, to your point, are, I think, maybe residual is the is the right word. They sort of accumulate over time, right? And, you know, I, would, I remember being a young 
a young man uh, many, many years ago, and I told my parents I didn't want to go to college because I had such a sort of miserable high school experience because it was just, I didn't want to do that work. Like, well, who wants to do this crap? I don't want to read that. Why would I read that? Like, I wanted to learn, but not that kind of thing. Thankfully, they counseled me and said, <laughs> you, yes, you do want to go to college. And I didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do and be and I certainly didn't, I, I had some of the thinking skills that I have now, but I didn't, they weren't sort of crystallized in the way that they are now. And probably that will be more true in 10, 20 years, um, assuming my brain doesn't deteriorate too badly. <laughs> but it, and I know you were running up against a, a stop uh, here, but uh, I'm curious. So I've got two daughters, one uh, a freshman in high school, one a junior, starting to look at, at education or uh, uh, university and, and higher education. She wants to, she thinks to be a, a um, elementary school teacher, which certainly is a, a fine profession. I'm not sure if I would advocate for it necessarily, but, uh, you know, if that's what she wants to do. But I'm, I, I was talking with her saying, you know, you may want to get a bachelor's degree in something with a teaching certificate so that you have more options because oddly enough, teaching certificates, you know, teachers are not qualified to do anything else other than teach on paper when in fact they actually have quite a few skills and it's a whole other argument. But what, if any advice might you give somebody in that kind of a position as they think about where they might go over the next, you know, four years to 10 years? Well, first of all, I wrote a book called 10 Things Employers Want You to Learn in College, and it's, 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 it's last edition was 2012. You might want to get that book for her to read it because it emphasizes the non-academic activities that are so essential hmm. to finding a career. Second of all, the schools of ed are a puzzlement to me. Um, don't know. I'm not a big fan of studying teaching. I'm a big fan of volunteering and going in the classroom. Mm. And sometimes they won't let the kids in the classroom right away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they should go in the classroom right away because they want to see, they shouldn't see what they're up against. Yep, I agree. I think, I think teach for America is for somebody who's not totally committed to education, but thinking about it is a really good alternative because it, you, you teach for two years, you get paid a full salary, they train you. The, the, the education professors don't like it because they throw the kids in the classroom after six, six weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I've had many of my students do, do it. It's, it's, they all are glad they did it. Some of them went into teaching, some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so Teach for America is an alternative, and when you're in college, you can get a Teach for America internship um, you can get the experience of preparing to be a teacher without going to the school of ed. Now, if she's doing elementary ed, uh, maybe that would be a better path. But the more she gets skills, um, and I have a list of skills, 38 skills, um, all kinds of skills, the better prepared she'll be for any career, including teaching. Mm -hmm. And one of my big things is I think Excel is life. Students should not graduate college without a solid experience in Excel because all the jobs, you will be doing Excel. Um, but, the kid, but they don't do that in high school and college very well uh, because it takes practice. So there are certain basic skills dealing with data and Excel and that kind of stuff is very important. Um, and I believe you should only do it, you do, should do it in internships because the academics who teach methods teach it at too abstract a level and doesn't mean they can use it. Yeah. I don't know if you're following me. So what I think she should, you know, and, and if she's in college, there are like student groups who go into the schools. She could go into schools with them. Mm-hmm. She should go into the schools with them. So she should look for experiences to supplement the academics because the academics is not going to do it. Yeah. Well, I know you've got to go. The book is The Path to Equity, Inclusion in the Kingdom of Liberal Arts. Any um, any parting thoughts or places they should find it? I mean, it's on Amazon, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Any other places yeah. that you want them to go and find you and any parting shots here? 
Well, they can email me at wdcopeland at syr.edu. They could go to my site, which is billcopeland.com, to get a fuller view of what I'm talking about. I'm an advocate of skills. I want skills, more skills, less content, but still content. And when you're teaching content, pay attention to the skills. Um, and I think that's what's happening because the students are demanding it. Hmm. The students are demanding it. The parents are demanding it. The politicians are demanding it. The problem is the curriculum doesn't change very much and the, the institutional constraints are too strong. As far as teachers go, teach your content, but take these skills and make sure you're, you're thinking about it. Um, and I have the list. There's 38 skills and 10 skill sets, which is on my website. Um, so I think, I think every teacher should have these skills in mind and create learning opportunities where they ex exercise the skills as they're doing the content. And they'll actually do the content better if they do that. So... Yeah, I would. Uh, go okay. ahead. We'll put those in the show notes, and and there's lots more we could talk about. But yeah. uh, as I said, you've got uh, you've got some place to be. I will say there's a chapter number fifteen, K twelve toxicity. So, uh, folks who are interested in in uh, more of the K twelve that we didn't get in, into today, um, they can get the book and, and read that chapter for sure. So, Bill, um, appreciate the conversation, and as always, I hope it's helpful. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to learn about you and your views. It's great. And uh, I think you're doing the right thing and trying to deal with this dilemma of skills versus knowledge. Yeah, uh, I appreciate is, that. It's, a, it's an uphill battle. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. What we need to do is spend enough time together that we can start to translate our ideas into each other's language and include one another in this community of inquiry. And that is the work of love.